let me introduce our speaker today. It's JJ Strange, and it's a pleasure to have her here. Uh, JJ uh, is coming to us from Madison, where she's in the program of History, Science, Medicine, and Technology. Previously, uh, she was uh, awarded degrees um, in biology, uh, as well as uh, a master's degree in East Asian studies from Columbia University. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to say that um, she's going to be a Fulbright Scholar in Taiwan associated with Academia Sinica in the next uh, year or so. So she's going to be leaving Madison uh, and going to Taiwan. Uh, I first became uh, uh, colleagues uh, with, um, with JJ uh, when we started um, interacting around some of the resources at um, the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy uh, and the UW School of Pharmacy. And uh, we started having conversations about whether or not she could do an independent study and what kind of um, work she might um, be interested in. Little did I know, uh, little could I have conceived of um, that it would amount to what she's gonna talk about today. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled um, to uh, turn it over to you, uh, JJ. Thank you so much. That was a really kind introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Luke said, I am JJ, um, and I'm a PhD student, and uh, I'm really excited to share this today. And I've been in and out of the uh, AIHP archives for about a, near, uh, about a year now. And today I'm going to share with you some a very interesting set of materials that are in the archives, some of which are extremely rare. And um, all the images you're going to see today are uh, of materials that are in the archives at this moment. So without further ado, this project itself actually began as kind of an offhanded comment and eventually grew into an exhibit that really got to celebrate the diversity on the UW-Madison campus in the first half of the 20th century. Um, this talk will have two parts to it. Uh, first, I will discuss the materials themselves, as well as a brief historic overview. And uh, the second part is going to discuss the creation of the exhibit and using the archival materials themselves. And I really want to thank um, archivist Hannah Swan and Beth Fisher, who were vital in putting together an exhibit of the materials that uh, really told the story of the students. And the exhibit itself is still up in the School of Pharmacy on the first floor right outside AIHP. Um, and uh, we're hoping that if you're not in Madison, we're hoping to someday turn it into a digital um, exhibit, but that's some ways off at the moment. All right, so this project began for me in the fall of 2020, my very first semester on campus. Through a seminar, I discovered that UW-Madison had a history of Chinese scholars from 1907 to 1945. This was particularly exciting, uh, as my dissertation includes Chinese historical actors who had studied in the USA on what is called the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship. This scholarship began in 1905 when the United States and the Qing Empire negotiated war indemnities paid by the Qing returned to Chinese citizens as funding for studying at a U.S. university. The Indemnity Scholarship offered a twofold opportunity. First, for Chinese students to travel and be educated in, quote, Western studies, or xixue, what you and I might really call STEM. And second, for the US, it was a way of influencing Chinese citizens to have a favorable outlook towards future American trade and diplomatic endeavors. The money from the Indemnity Scholarship ran out quickly, but even so, Chinese students continue to arrive at UW-Madison. The UW Archives has a small collection. The yearbooks were a particular help in putting together this exhibit and finding people. Um, and I learned that the first Chinese student came in 1907, and that by 1912, there were already two clubs on uh, campus, the Chinese Student Club and the International Club, which acted as a political center and, so and the center of social life at UW-Madison for the Chinese students. Unfortunately, though, the UW archive is limited in what it had to offer, and my project really stalled up until, as uh, Professor Luke Rickard mentioned, uh, we were started talking and passing about IHP, and I was invited to come and take a look. And within 
AIHP, a series of, of archive folders, objects, and newspapers told a vibrant story of the Chinese students who trained at the pharmacy school. And while, as you can see here, not every student is going to be featured today, I really wanted to draw together a group of students who very expressively balance the weight of the Chinese nation's push for a modern future and the diplomatic hopes of the U.S. So the first person I want you to meet is a man by the name of K.K. Chen or Ke Hui Chen. Uh, he is perhaps the most famous of the students and as he would make him his name for himself in American history books. Uh, Chen spent much of his time in the School of Pharmacy researching the effects of ephedrine, a drug derived from ma huang, a plant that's found in northeastern China. Uh, this chemical compound was used to treat lung diseases such as asthma and bronchitis. Ma huang, uh, among many other medical plants that are listed in Chinese pharmacopias, known as bun cao. While Chen was not the first to synthesize the compound, he and Dr. Carl Nielsen are credited with bringing it to the attention of American pharmaceutical manufacturers, in this case, uh, in particular, Eli Lilly, changing the landscape and introducing traditional Chinese medicine on a global biochemical scale. He later attended medical school at Johns Hopkins he, uh, before settling in Indiana for 30 years as a leading pharmacologist pharmacological researcher at Eli Lilly before retiring in California. He remained in contact with the School of Pharmacy until he died in 1988. Um, while at UW, Chen not only trained as a pharmacist, but played in the band. He organized Chinese student national meetups, one of which happened in Madison and had almost 300 attendants. And uh, he edited a national newsletter for Chinese students. It wasn't just, um, it, for him, it wasn't just about learning and taking his knowledge back to China. It, he really carved out a space for the Chinese students on campus. And so just to give you a little introduction of what you're seeing here. So the first image here is actually KK Chen, a very young KK Chen. Um, and here is the chemical compound uh, ephedrine that he has synthesized. This is uh, the one below here is really the, uh, the the plant actually ma huang uh, which is known as ephedra in english and then um, the chinese here is just uh, a famous pharmacopoeia which is called the bun cao gamu um, here you can see the american uh, pharmaceutical association published about the different strains of ephedra in across the world but it was really ma huang that was shipped uh, from china that was used to synthesize ephedrine and then you have uh, an Eli Lilly pamphlet, which of, of which there are many in the Institute, um, uh, which ha uh, discusses the preparations for ephedrine sulfate. All right. So another student who made himself known for his political activism is Ming Hung Zhou, um, or M.H. Cho. Uh, he was a contemporary of K.K. Chen's and worked on the medical properties of Star Nice, but instead of uh, making a medical impact, he used his platform to connect Chinese students throughout the campus and the country. Uh, M.H. Cho uh, worked to advocate for issues of surrounding Chinese standing, China's standing in the world and the treatment of Chinese students on campus. His accomplishments included participating in the Chinese Student Club, the International Club, and he was also on the editing board for the Chinese Student Monthly, which was a national newsletter connecting the growing Chinese student population in the United States. These organizations pushed for Chinese exchange students to have a community and gave them space to discuss political issues important to their group. And delightfully, uh, the Chinese Student Monthly, this newsletter that I'm talking about, is actually available digitally at most university libraries. So I would highly recommend if you have an interest or a uh, 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 want to read them, uh, perusing them. They really tell the life stories and they really give you a snapshot into the people who were living in the US. Um, so here are some more images from AIHP that we got to use. So this is, he was, not he didn't have as many photos uh, but he did have a lot of newspaper articles which is what i'm sharing here so this one is pharmaceutical student from china in our university trying to make a new perfume so star anise maybe it wasn't medical but uh maybe he was trying to research it for medical purposes but found that it just smelled nicer and so he was making it into a perfume um 
And I really want to draw your attention to is this the next two articles there. This is the title of this article here. So Chinese drugs studied at UW, students from Peking and Ningbo uh, to serve their government. And they, then it says work slow due to difficulty in finding English equivalents for Chinese terms, find French hard to speak. Uh, translation was a, a, a huge issue um, between translating between Chinese traditional medicine and English and trying to find equivalents to figure out if something had already been found within uh, Chinese traditional medicine or if it needed a new name. And in this article, both actually KK Chen is also featured in this article further up, but they both discuss going back to work for the Chinese government, that that is actually their sort of expressed goal is to eventually go home and make sure that they are working towards a modern and um, modernizing and making sure that China can continue moving forward in the world. All right, so on the other hand, we have an S.Y. Chen, and he came to the University of Madison in uh, University of Wisconsin Madison as an undergraduate in 1914. He returned to the School of Pharmacy to work with Dr. Dr. Edward Kremers in 1925. Both also, uh, both KK Chen and Joe also worked closely with the School of Pharmacy's second president. So these all are connected through Dr. Kremers. Um, Indeed, the reason we even have these records is because Kremers kept them and left them to the AIHP. After working in New York City, S.Y. Chen returned to China in 1929. He was not as well known in America as the two previously mentioned, but he did found the first biochemical-based pharmaceutical school in China called the National School of Pharmacy. The school taught techniques and theories common in Euro-American pharmacy, and Chen was given the task of setting up the school by the Education Bureau as a modernization effort for China. Chen and Kremers actually remained in very close contact through letters. In many of his letters, Chen mentioned his ongoing research in biochemically understanding Chinese medicinal plants, and he often exchanged specimens with Kremers for continued research. The only notable disruption to these letters was in 1937, when Ched fled from China's coast towards the interior, running from the invading Japanese army. He and his pharmacy school landed in Chongqing, Sichuan, where he, was, where he hired other Chinese students trained in American pharmaceutical techniques, such as uh, Zhu Qiang Liu, uh, a later generation of UW-Madison pharmacy student. Um, Kremers often lamented in his letters to Chen about the devastation of war and really wished for a swift end to the fighting. Um, so the handsome man on our uh, right here is S.Y. Chen. So he returned to home in 1929. He sent a, a, an image of himself taken in Shanghai uh, in 1930. Uh, to Professor Kremers personally, he signed it, as you can see here. Uh, this photo is actually up in the exhibit right now, and it's a very stunning photo. Uh, the next image is postcards. Another thing that is kind of in this collection, in this in these set of materials, is the, all these postcards. And this is one that S.Y. Chen sent. It's uh, the Temple of Heaven, which is in Beijing, and it wishes. It says, "A Merry Christmas and a Happy and Prosperous New Year" from S.Y. Chen. And then the final images, which are a little harder to see, but they are actually of his lab in Chongqing. And um, by, I believe it's in the 19, I think 1940s is when these were taken. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but there are actually women in this picture as well. So there were men and women participating in his school and learning and training, as well as participating in labs. Okay. And so beyond uh, the impacts of alumni and faculty relationships, the School of Pharmacy's Chinese student population felt the reper repercussions of the war all the way in the US. So the only woman in the Chinese student AIHP materials, Shei Che Chen, began her work at the School of Pharmacy in 1937. However, in 1939, she received word that her father had been killed during an attack by the Japanese army. She sold all of her belongings to return home to China, which the Capital Times reported on uh, over the course of several months in morbid detail. These articles often described her despondent moods and tragic story, along with exoticizing the dresses and jewelry she sold to buy a ticket home. 
Though she did not complete her studies, she remained in contact with Kremers and became a teacher in the Yunnan region close to the Vietnam border, then it was called Indochina. She often discussed finishing her pharmacy degree and her written exchanges to Kremers, but with the cost and the war, she never came back to the United States. Kremers was encouraging of her to complete the school, but she, he also was sympathetic to her situation. And so here she is. Uh, this was enclosed in a letter that was sent after she had arrived home and settled. Uh, along with these two images, the first one is just a street uh, in on the back. It says a uh, street in Indochina so in, in, near the Indochina border is my guess, because these are still written in Chinese, um, but it could be actually inside Indochina itself along the border. And then this is her classroom uh, where she was teaching. So she sent these two pictures. They're actually quite small. We've blown them up here so you can get more detail, but they're actually only about this big. And now, okay, so now I've introduced you to everyone. So let's, I'm going to put my historian cap back on and kind of and hit my final point for this part of the talk. What is at stake for these for the Chinese students coming here? The title of my exhibit, Translating Tradition, ultimately is an argument. Despite being thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean, at the turn of the 20th century, the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Pharmacy became a hotspot for Chinese students interested in researching medicinal plants indigenous to China. Under the advisement of Dr. Edward Kremers, these students, these Chinese students brought their knowledge of medicine to American pharmaceutical research with the broader goal of equalizing China and its traditional knowledge on an international stage. Though many of the people featured in the AIHP materials took different paths in life by working through the archive, one thing has become abundantly clear. Working on Chinese medicine using pharmaceutical techniques was a matter of national pride. One article in the Chinese Chemist and Druggist by Yu Jian Yang explained, Chinese medicine did not have chemistry-based research to validate the practice. Thus, when Chinese drugs were on an international market, they were not identified as Chinese, but rather associated with isolated chemicals. Uh, this was published in 1924. At no point were these Chinese students looking to abandon traditional Chinese medicine for a different kind of pharmaceutical tradition, but rather they endeavored to make the medicine of their country accessible to a chemically based American markets. This pride toward Chinese pharmaceutical practices is also reflected in KK Chen's writing. Quote, it is worth noting that opium, which has become a curse to China, is not sold in drug shops and toxic substances such as arsenic, nux vacuma, and croton seeds, and so forth, cannot be purchased at any price except by prescription of a physician. This is in sharp contrast with modern pharmacies in China, in which morphine preparations and other narcotics can always be purchased under some fancy name. That was written um, for the Annals of Medical History, which is an English uh, journal, and it was published in 1929. Um, and so just to give you a little tour of these images, uh, we have the Yu, uh, uh, Yu Jen Yang's article, which was actually has a very dramatic title. It's called The Indifference of Chinese People Towards Chinese Medicine. And what he's talking about here is uh, the frustration that he has that there's this long tradition of uh, a traditional way of preparing medicine and uh, how with Chinese pharmacies and the fact that there are no chemical research or there's no research that's going on on them that th there's no way for them to penetrate the American markets and make it so that it is clear that this is a Chinese product, that this is a Chinese good. And so what he's really lamenting is that people don't have the training necessary to be able to do this research. And so he's, he's sort of encouraging of his fellow men to, to begin to study uh, pharmacy. Um, the middle image here is a uh, image that was also that's also an AIHP, and it is the Ma Huang that was shipped from China, and it's at an Eli Lilly factory. So this is uh, this shows just you know bush bushels and bushels of this, and it would eventually be processed uh, into a uh, ephedrine. And this brings up the economy point, which is that this isn't just you know, this isn't just, oh, well, we need to know, but let people know that this is China, this is Chinese products, but it's also money that would come in. And, you know, if you're processing all of this for, 
a, a medicine, right? You need constant supplies of it. So it becomes this, this big economic drive within the pharmacy and, the, and within the trade catalogs, um, which I have one of some of the trade catalogs that we have that, that are at AIHP are so interesting. So this is the Chinese chemist and druggist, um, which uh, ran in the 1920s. And it's a bilingual trade magazine. So the first half of it is all in Chinese. And the second half of it, some of it, it some of it's just translations, but there are new stuff in uh, the English as well. What's really interesting are the translated articles, because in those articles, you've got the Chinese, you've got the English, and sometimes the Chinese and the English don't line up. And that's been a really kind of fun trying to figure out why it might be that it's presented in one way in English and one way in Chinese. And I'm still working on those, but they are just so cool. And the ones that are in AIHP, they don't exist digitally. This, uh, this, uh, Magazine exists, uh, different issues of it exist, but not the ones that are actually in AIHP. So it's really, really awesome that we have access and that they're just uh, at my at the university that I attend. So this small but robust collection of materials in the AIHP reveals a tight-knit community of Chinese pharmacy students, many of whom stayed in contact with Premers and each other long after they left Madison. These students arrived initially carrying the hopes and dreams of a burgeoning Chinese nation and coming to UW-Madison as strangers who in time would become political activists, doctors, and teachers during a very complicated time in China. While the archive cannot provide details of every Chinese student who passed through Madison's campus, their legacy remains. These students changed the School of Pharmacy and the uh, American pharmaceutical industry. So that is the history portion of this. So next, I want to kind of shift gears a bit, and I want to spend some time talking about the actual process of building um, the exhibit. I'd been working in AIHP and, and really had a broader goal to shine a spotlight on this early community. Um, sadly, they're not as well known as some of the other uh, non-white communities in uh, UW-Madison, despite facing a lot of the same issues so thus, the idea of an exhibit was particularly appealing because it could reach a wider audience than uh, only writing a paper. Um, so I, the naive historian, of course, tried to cram as much as I could into the exhibit, which is the image on the left. This is the initial thought behind uh, this exhibit. And if you'll notice, it has one, two, three, four, five, six uh, possible shelves and lots of stuff. So I was trying to really just show every piece of material that I could. Um, both uh, Hannah and Beth were able to rein me in very quickly once I presented the idea and helped me think about what I wanted to tell, what stories I actually wanted to, to represent in the exhibit. And it was pared down and pared down until we came up with this three shelf idea, which features first on the first top shelf, the UW uh, Madison students, and then the second shelf would showcase the close connection to Kremers. And then the third shelf would um, really be on the role of traditional Chinese medicine at the School of Pharmacy and the US drug market. So this is just sort of the initial like sketches and thought bubbles behind it. Once we had a concept, the next was to create the captions. And uh, this process was really interesting as I'm used to writing a certain way, namely winding and academically, as you can tell by the way I talk. But these uh, needed to be, these uh, captions really needed to be short and to the point and just move people enough through the exhibit so that they could contextualize the items. Um, I also chose, and this was a personal project, I really chose to, I chose to translate the exhibit into Chinese. So current exchange students could also access the exhibit in their language, which is a nod to the title, Translating Tradition, um, which turned out to be uh, more of a challenge than I thought, but it was it was good. I got to brush up on my Chinese a little bit. Um, and then we had to install. So install day was awesome. Uh, it was a long day. Uh, we initially started worrying that we weren't going to have enough stuff to put into the cases. And we had to sort of set it all up on the desk and figure out how we were going to make stuff stand, what it was going to look like. And then also organize all of the placards. And uh, 
we ended up working, uh, we ended up having to clean everything. And then we ended up working well past closing to take get this exhibit totally set up. And if you're interested about that process, there's actually an Instagram reel, which you can follow through the QR code um, by uh, Hannah Swan through the AIHP Instagram at Pharmacy History. And these photos are actually courtesy of Hannah because I was uh, not paying attention and just trying to get everything done. And she was she was smart enough to 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 snap a few pics while I was running around. Um, so the actual exhibit itself, this is what it looks like currently. Uh, it is behind some glass, but uh, we were able to move the glass for nice pictures. And so this exhibit actually ends up having a horizontal as well as a vertical storytelling. So along the top here, um, you can see KK Chen and his career at UW Madison. And then if you move down, there's also discussion of ephedrine, which he's closely related to. And then you have SY Chen. And then this talks about his career and how he ultimately was forced to move into the interior as well as some of his letters and then the pharmaceutical industry itself, which he was key in working and setting up and making sure that there was a sustainable future for China. Uh, and then we have uh, Shui Cha Chen and M.H. Cho and uh, their stories as well. And then all of the postcards. So one of the things that really struck me about this set of materials was how many students wrote and sent postcards regularly, yearly, it seemed like, to uh, Kremers. And so we, we picked out kind of the most the most interesting looking ones. The one that's open here actually has a really lovely note um, from one of his students who is not featured today, but it, it, it essentially is thanking him for being the teacher that he was. And along with postcards and seasonal greetings, there were also um, images of, of weddings as well as uh, baby announcements. So this was this was not just uh, a teacher and his students. These were obviously like lifelong friends who were in communication and very grateful for what they were able to build with him. And then on the bottom, we have more um, objects, which are always fun to look at. So the first one is a uh, so Chinese medicine, and it has uh, royal jelly and and leave ginseng and so it's a box with like very bright packaging and actually I think the vials are still in it though there it's not open and uh more pamphlets and then this box here which you can kind of see in both of the pictures is actually a specimen box so it's sent from the Peking Union Medical College to Kremers and it uh is kind of nailed down it's just a simple box but it likely held specimens my guess is mint because Kremers was often writing to S.Y. Chen about mint and wanting more mint to be sent so I I guess he was doing some experiments with that. So this is, we had an opening day and it was awesome. We had a bunch of people from the history department, from uh, across campus come in and I got to stand by the exhibit and answer questions. I gave a, a talk as well and it was really fun and I was really excited to share this with the, the campus. And then we also on the opening day got to open it to uh, the, we got to open the Erdong room and I put a bunch of letters. So this, this image is mostly historians uh, who are uh, looking at the kind of longer form letters, which don't necessarily go into the exhibits just because it would be too far away. Most people couldn't read it. It was such a neat experience and it was really awesome that AIHP was able to support kind of putting this together and really helped me along. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what I have for you. Thank you so much for your time. And please feel free to ask about either the history part or the exhibit part, anything you would want to know. I know it was a whirlwind tour of the early 19th, uh, early 20th century uh, at the School of Pharmacy. So please uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much.